It's great to be with you all. Um, I'm so grateful for all of you who have made the effort to come here. Um, I know uh, many of you will have 20, 50, 100, 200 emails to deal with um, for having carved out this time. So I think it means a lot that we've taken out time to be here. So very grateful. I can't resist. Um, I want to go back to the lunch panel. Do health, religion, and spiritu spirituality need one another? Um, uh, and just simply go back to that question by stating, uh, engaging what I think is a, uh, the elephant in the room, um, which the way I think about it uh, regarding medicine and healthcare is that there are three um, major social powers that, have, that are engaging medicine and controlling it. Those social powers are science and technology being one of them. An incredible, powerful social force. Uh, secondly, and obviously market forces, capitalism and money. Money, 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 money. That's everywhere in healthcare, and it's an incredibly powerful social force. So you have science and technology on the one hand, you have market forces on the other, and then finally you have legal and bureaucratic forces that have been growing, uh, in, and they are overtaking, I would argue, healthcare and medicine and diminishing uh, further and further the person uh, and care. And my question is, uh, and I, this is my theological hat on, if you, if you would allow me for a moment, is what is powerful enough? What social force could actually rise up and push back on money, science and technology, and bureaucracy? Is there any social force that you can think of that's actually powerful enough not to remove those items, because those are all goods, those are all human goods, but to order them and to put them in their place, in their right orderly place, in serving the patient? And I would argue there's only one that I know of. And the fact is it's been uh, largely removed from medicine. And it's the social force of religion. Religion itself is the one force that's actually powerful enough to speak to money. There's no other social force that I think exists. And the very fact that religion has been uh, marginalized uh, largely because of its own decisions. So it's not just the secular people who have pushed out religion in my view. It's religion itself that has left and vacated healthcare. So do health, religion, and spirit, well, there, there are these powerful social forces that are almost religious-like themselves. And there's only one other power that could come in and potentially order it. That's my, that's my two cents on how to, and how to think about that, uh, about, the, about these issues. We sprinkle in a little bit of spirituality or religion, and we're these isolated individuals and will never change these incredible structural institutional uh, forces where everyone is deeply socialized. And there's only one strong enough socialization power that can, that can counter that. So that's why my, uh, for my attention, um, I've been turning increasingly to religious communities. It's religious communities that in a lot of ways have uh, vacated uh, healthcare and I ask the question, can um, religious communities be, be brought in, or be brought back, back in? Uh, and that uh, uh, launched the National Clergy Project on end-of-life care, and I'm just going to, for 10 minutes, present um, some uh, preliminary data uh, on clergy life-prolonging religious values um, at the end of life. Um, you've already heard some of the background. Uh, in a uh, the coping with cancer study, the per which was a prospective multi-site study of terminally ill cancer patients, in which it was reported that religious community spiritual support, very surprisingly, was associated with decreased hospice utilization in the last seven days of life, increased ICU utilization, and increased death in the ICU. In fact, if you were visited by religious communities uh, at baseline, you are six times higher odds of dying in the ICU versus not being visited by religious communities. I think uh, that, is a, that, that in itself speaks for itself. So what about clergy? Um, 
46% of cancer patients uh, in the U.S. indicate that they're visited by clergy members. Um, rough estimates are that there's approximately 340,000 clergy in the United States today. Um, in comparison to those who are very important, but a very sm a much smaller group, there's only a approximately 10,000 hospital chaplains. And community clergy uh, spend approximately four to four and a half hours per week uh, visiting the sick in hospitals, as well as congregational members who are shut in in their own homes. Um, so despite the prevalence of clergy, there's uh, no national data that engages what clergy theological beliefs, what their religious values are, as well as what interactions they have with congregational members. We know that they're visiting and engaging, but we, we have no idea what's actually going on. So the National Clergy Project on End-of-Life Care is a cross-sectional mail survey of congregational leaders, and we used a random sample of 2,000 clergy from across the United States based on what we believe is a somewhat comprehensive database of U.S. houses of worship based on um, a private business file from a company called InfoGroup. Um, in the study, we oversampled from black and Latino clergy because we've seen in the Coping with Cancer study that, that uh, racial and ethnic minorities were more likely to receive aggressive care, so we wanted to see whether black and, uh, and Latino clergy, how they engage end-of-life uh, beliefs and with their congregational members. The data was collected uh, in, uh, in completed in March of 2015, so just, over, uh, uh, just about a year ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, we achieved a 58 or 60 percent response rate in which 1,005 clergy responded. And we weighted, uh, in the analysis that I'll show you, we weighted the analysis that adjusts for things such as race and the differing race response rates. Um, so you've seen these questions before. There, similar questions were asked uh, not only of patients in the Coping with Cancer 2 study, uh, but we asked uh, similar questions among clergy. Um, we framed these questions a little bit differently. We said, imagine visiting a congregational member with a cancer, and doctors said that the patient was extremely likely to die in the next six months, regardless of medical care provided. Consider the following statements a patient might make to what extent do you agree with these statements made by the patient? Uh, we had six statements. These are four. I'll just show you four of them. Um, I, the patient says to the clergy member, I believe God will cure me of this cancer. And we ask clergy, how much do you agree with the patient's statement? Not at all, a little, somewhat, quite a bit, or completely. Um, regarding the domain of this, what we call the sanctity of life, a patient says, I accept every medical treatment because my faith says to do everything I can to stay alive. Regarding the idea that God is in control, the patient says, because of my faith, I do not need to think about future medical decisions. And then finally, regarding uh, the concept of redemptive suffering, measured by this question, uh, the statement, I must endure painful medical procedures because suffering is part of God's way of testing me, and this belief recognizes that good can come out of bad things like physical pain, and it suggests that one should not run away from suffering, but endure through it. So our outcome variable, uh, this was our exposure variable or our predictor variable, uh, what, we're, what I'm calling life-prolonging religious values. And it's a com combination of a theological idea and a medical decision. Our outcome variables um, included the most recent clergy relationship with a dying patient and whether or not they had any conversation of, of, end of, of having an end-of-life medical decision with the most recent congregational member who had died, uh, as well as the congregant medical care received in the last week of life. So we asked clergy in the last week of life where the congregational member was uh, including spending any days in hospice or any days in the ICU. And in the analysis, um, we looked at life prolonging religious values and medical decisions, and we created out of these six questions a composite score in which you could score a six to a 30. Uh, and we took 
simply the median split, and we call these high or low life prolonging religious values, where clergy were agreeing with these statements made by a congregational member. Um, in all our adjusted, adjusted analyses, our models adjusted for clergy gender, their age, their years as a minister, uh, whether they were a senior minister or an assistant, congregational income, clergy race, as well as their geographical location. So uh, among clergy uh, that we sampled, 98% of clergy in the United States report to be of some Christian denomination or tradition. Uh, only 2% were of other world religions. Um, we've kind of gotten beat up on this in our review process uh, of some, a few of the papers. Uh, I wish, in retrospect, we had oversampled from minority world religions, uh, but we didn't. But this is, um, it's important to understand that um, though the U.S. population as a whole is approximately 70% report to be Christian, among congregations, when that is the sample frame, 98% um, are, are Christian. Uh, and then you can also see 80% um, were white, 14% black, 6% were other, 5% reported to be Hispanic or Latino. Among uh, Christ the Christian denominations, 83% were uh, Protestant, 9% were Roman Catholic. There again, just to, to explain that, tw about 20% of the U.S. population is Roman Catholic, um, but only 9% of congregations are Roman Catholic. And with a pre-shortage, you get much larger congregations uh, with fewer clergy serve, serving them. So that's kind of, that's what's going on there. 44% of clergy identified themselves as evangelical. 34% said they were either mainline or liberal. 12% said they were Pentecostal. And 9% said none applied. So what about these life prolonging religious values? Uh, so we asked clergy to respond to a congregant statement, uh, as I just said, and 86% of clergy agreed with a congregant statement that God would do a miracle in curing from cancer. 55% agreed with the idea of the sanctity of life, that accepting that they would, ex they agreed with the patient who said they, they should accept every medical treatment because of the sanctity of life. 29% agreed that since God is in control, it's not necessary to think about future medical decisions. And 27% of clergy agreed with a congregational member uh, who held a belief that redemptive suffering enables endurance of painful medical procedures. So at least based on this, it appears that it's common for clergy to agree with statements made by congregational members who are applying their religious values to specific medical decisions that are leading, leading to more life prolonging um, measures. So again, we're trying to break down why, are, what, why would religious community spiritual support be associated with more aggressive care, and we're digging down to try to identify what are the specific religious beliefs that might be driving that spiritual care. We, based on the coping with cancer data, it does not seem that spiritual care itself is the concept that leads to more aggressive care, and in fact, among medical, uh, when given by medical teams, it leads to less aggressive care, which suggests that it's a particular type of spiritual care that's leading to these um, outcomes. Um, just to compare how clergy responded versus uh, from the, uh, the, the coping with cancer too, um, you can see similarities between patients and clergy regarding miracles, uh, regarding the sanctity of life, um, and, and these others. Uh, for the most part, other than miracles, uh, patients were more likely than clergy uh, to actually make these statements. Again, these are two separate databases. They're not correlated with one another, but just so you can see compar comparisons. Well, which clergy are more likely to endorse these religious values that lead to more uh, life uh, uh, more aggressive measures at the end of life. Um, in our analysis, after adjusting for various demographic factors that I already uh, mentioned, uh, we found that clergy who were Pentecostal, evangelical, those who were black clergy, and those who were serving in congregations of lower income 
um, these were all independent variables that were predicting um, in our adjusted analyses uh, uh, endorsement of these religious values. Uh, when we asked uh, clergy, uh, they reported on whether they discussed any of the following medical decisions with the most recent dying congregational member. You can see that 55% of clergy indicated that they had a discussion about going into hospice. 44% of clergy indicated that they had a discussion about uh, having a DNR order. 44% discussed increasing medication to lessen pain. 38% foregoing future medical treatment and 32% stopping future medical, medical treatment. Again, that's, we asked them, the very last person in your congregation who had died that you provided spiritual care to, did you have any of these conversations? So this is not all the congregational members that they've cared for, it's just the very last one. Uh, and this data suggests that uh, the clergy are having uh, frequent end of life medical dis discussions with congregational members. So what is the relationship between these religious values, these theological beliefs, and having an end-of-life conversation? And as you can see here, uh, they, are, they are related, um, as we would uh, most likely expect. Um, here you can see that clergy who were high in their religious values um, were less likely to discuss with their congregational member going into hospice less likely to discuss stopping treatment and less likely to forgo a discussion on um, foregoing treatment. So in the, in the adjusted analysis, re, uh, higher endorsement of these religious values is associated with less frequent end of life discussions between clergy and congregational members. Well, what about, uh, uh, congregational members uh, in their final week of life uh, who go into hospice or go, uh, and re uh, go into the ICU in the last seven days of life. Uh, do religious values, are they predictive of what congregational members actually do? Um, and here we found um, that the subdomain, that the statement of that God is in control was associated with congregational members who spent any days in the ICU in the final week of life. Uh, we also found that clergy who indicated that they, that they had not had a hospice discussion with their congregational member, that congregational member was much less likely to go into hospice in the final week of life, and they had higher odds of going into the ICU in the final week of life if the, if the, the clergy member had not discussed hospice. Um, however, uh, the, the total score of these religious values was not associated, was not directly associated in adjusted analysis with, with these uh, end of life outcomes. Uh, there are many limitations to this study. Uh, we've heard about cross-sectional uh, cross studies. Um, we cannot demonstrate a, a causation, but only association. The outcomes uh, are clergy reported they're not patient reported, uh, so we could not, uh, uh, we, we're just reporting what clergy remember, um, and so uh, we're limited by that. And then as well as these are overwhelmingly Christian clergy, we simply did not have enough clergy from other world religions um, to make, um, uh, to say, re really to say anything uh, out of this study. So in, in summary, um, clergy religious values and end-of-life medical decisions uh, are common. Uh, life prolonging religious values decrease the odds of a clergy having an end of life medical conversation with a congregational member. The study found that life prolonging religious values themselves as a total score were not associated with medical outcomes. Uh, but we also found uh, that when a clergy member did not discuss hospice with the congregational member, that congregational member had a lower odds of uh, receiving hospice and higher odds of going into the ICU. Um, so in the form of a basic conceptual model, the data suggests that 
theological beliefs or religious values um, appears to decrease end-of-life medical discussions, including the lower likelihood of not having a hospice conversation. And not having a hospice discussion is associated with less hospice and more ICU care in the final week of life. So in future engagement uh, of clergy concerning end-of-life issues, uh, we need to consider clergy discussions about having uh, medical uh, about talking about medical decisions and educating clergy on the possibility of talking with their congregational member about end of life medical decisions. Uh, and also, we need to partner with clergy educators in considering how religious values and theological beliefs are being applied and in influencing end of life medical decisions. Uh, there are many people who helped make this study possible. Um, uh, including our funders, the National Cancer Institute, the Issachar Fund, the Templeton Foundation, and, and other friends of our initiative. Thank you.